Hey everyone, before we begin with today's video, uh, just some quick context here. This episode is going to be a collection episode. That means it's going to contain some stories that we've previously covered before. But because I wanted to make a video solely on just Los Angeles stories and events that have happened in LA, well, I figured I'd go ahead and combine all the LA stories we've covered before and I'd just put them together in this episode. Now, don't worry if you're an OG subscriber, I've got a couple of brand new stories on this one that you might not have heard before. But with all of that said, make sure to sit back, relax, I'll turn down the lights, and now we'll begin with these scary stories from LA. This encounter happened to a friend and a co-worker of mine about 15 years ago. It took place in a suburb of Los Angeles, California. My friend, I'll call her Jody, lived with her parents and older brother in a house in a pretty nice neighborhood. They didn't really worry about crime, break-ins, anything like that whatsoever. Well, one night at about 2 a.m., Jody was awoken by a loud knocking at the front door. She jumped out of bed and then ran into the hallway. That's where her parents and brother were coming out of their own rooms. The knocking, now a pounding, continued. Stay here, said her father, and made his way toward the door. All of a sudden, there came a muffled male voice shouting, Help me! Help me! Jody and her mom grabbed each other in fear, and her dad looked out the peephole. There's nobody there, he said. He looked out the front window, where you could see part of the front door and porch. Well, he still didn't see anyone. He walked back toward his family, and that's when the loud knocking began again, this time even more frantic. Again, a voice shouted, Help! Help me! Jody's dad went to the phone and called 911, and while he was talking to the operator, her brother had walked up to the front of the house. The pounding was still going on, getting faster and faster until it was a constant banging. Help me! Help me! Oh God, help me! Jody in tears of fright by now looked over at her brother, who was standing in the family room, which was located to the left of the front door. His face was white, and he made an arm gesture for them to join him. Jody and her mom and her dad who was off the phone with the police by now, hurried into the family room, where they immediately realized why her brother's face had gone pale. The pounding and shouting was coming from underneath the family room floor. The police arrived minutes later, and it turned out that some guy in his 20s had gotten all out of his mind that night on crack, and had somehow made his way into the opening of the crawl space under the house which was located underneath the family room window. They never found out exactly what his intention was, but they assume he was trying to find a way into the house to rob it, but then got disorientated because he was so high and freaked out as well, hence the pounding and the shouting. This story gave me goosebumps the first time she told it to me, and I thought of it again when I discovered this forum. This is an experience of mine I had back in the summer of 2015. I was attending an anime convention in Los Angeles with a bunch of my friends who just like me were cosplaying as their favorite characters. I was dressed up as the popular virtual pop star Hatsune Miku and my other friends were dressed up as Megarin Luka and Kagamin Rin. Also there was Kagamin Lin. For context, we're all female and at the time we were all in our early 20s. Also, for this story, I'll refer to my friends as the characters they are dressed up as. Because, why not? Anyway, the creepy experience doesn't take place at the anime convention. Everyone there was super chill, and we made plenty of new friends, but instead it takes place somewhere else. After the second day of the convention, I wanted to do a little bit of more exploring LA before I would be returning back home. I myself had moved to NorCal the previous year to study parks and recreation at San Jose State University, and as this was the first time in almost a year that I had been back down here, I wanted to see the sights again. After all, it would be a while until I saw them all again. So my friends and I decided to go to the nearby Santa Monica and Venice Beach to go swimming. 
also to check out all the artsy stuff, and that was fine and all. And at about 5pm we decided to go grab some pizza. After that we stopped at an arcade, which also had a bowling alley. That's where we proceeded to spend the next couple of hours playing. This would be the location of my very, let's just say, unpleasant evening. So we were playing Dance Dance Revolution, and I noticed that we were starting to get quite the crowd. A huge mix. Kids, teenagers, and even some adults as well. After we had completed one of the songs, the crowd broke out into a huge cheer as we thanked them, and then I stepped down to let one of my other friends play. At this moment, a scrawny middle-aged man wearing all black approached me, and then he said he really loved the Hatsune Miku t-shirt I was wearing. While we weren't cosplaying there at the arcade, we did each wear our own shirts that had the character we had been cosplaying as before. I said thank you to the man with a smile before he starts asking me some questions. One of them was asking me if my friends and I were of Japanese descent, to which I told him we were, and this suddenly brings this strange smile to his face. I've always wanted to meet a cute Japanese girl, but I've never gotten the chance to do so. I said thank you in a very awkward and shy manner, before he then follows up by asking me if I would like to join him for dinner. I told him I had already ate with my friends and thanked him anyway, but then he asked me if I could take a picture with him. Before I got the chance to say anything, however, he pulls out his phone and then embraces me tightly as he tries to get a picture. I pretty much made an excuse on the spot saying I wasn't ready and so I put my hand up to cover my face. I then tried to pull away from him, which was a bit tough because he was holding on to me pretty firmly. But when I do, my friend with the Megarine Luca shirt comes running up to us. Some of the people who were watching my friends play see the awkward exchange, which causes the man to put his phone away and then walk in the other direction. Naturally, I was pretty freaked out by it. It's not every day some random man just grabs you and then embraces you and then tries to take a picture with you. So we notified a nearby security guard but it seemed the creep was already long gone. At least, so it seemed. At this point, my friends ask if I want to go back to the hotel, but I tell them I'm fine since I don't want to leave, and I don't want to give the guy the gratification that it creeped me out. Silly thinking, I know. Fast forward about 30 minutes later, my paranoia is really getting to me, and I keep getting this strange feeling like I'm being watched. My friends notice this, and finally, I cave in and tell them, okay, let's get going. So we pick out some prizes with the tickets we had won. I got myself a little Yoshi plush in case you're wondering, and we now exit to make our way to the parking lot. Unfortunately, it seems someone was waiting for us. The creeper from inside the arcade, he was just seemingly sitting there at a bench. Well, without question, when he spots us, he comes walking over and then of all things offers to give us crack for free. He said it was his treat. And that escalated really quickly, so we told him no, we're not interested, as he proceeds by stating it would make us feel so much better, to which again we say no thank you. This makes him angry, and now he states that he would take his harem of Japanese girls, that being us, by force, and back to his place and that if we didn't follow his directions, we were going to be in a world of hurt. Well, it's four against one, not sure how that's going to happen. We call them out on his bullshit, and then start to briskly walk to the car. He follows us there, and once we're in, he starts to bang on the window, saying how dare us disrespect him, and that he was going to kill us, yada yada yada. Now, I wish my friend would have run over his foot, but she didn't, as someone who happened to have been walking back to their car sees the man, and we could hear him asking him what he was doing. Before the creep leaves, we can hear him say, being muffled through the closed windows, You haven't seen the last of me. He then bolts it in the other direction, disappearing across the street and into the alley. Talk about unexpected and terrifying. In case you were curious, we did notify the LAPD, but 
nothing ever came of that creep as far as I can tell. As I look back, I am almost certain he had had to have been on drugs of some sort. I don't think any normal person would act that way. As far as I know, he didn't get the chance to take the photo as I had moved away and said no before he did it. But I just kind of wonder, however, had he taken any photos when we weren't looking? That idea is quite creepy, but I don't let it get to me. Sure, this might not be the scariest story in the world to some, but I would hope you would have taken a moment to put yourself in my shoes. I really wouldn't want you having to go through something like this. The Walmart Stories video that you released had a scary story that reminded me of my own encounter I had. This was in the fall of 2007, when I got out of work. And this took place in Los Angeles, California. Anyway, I was employed at a now defunct community center, and that afternoon I had to stay for overtime, as there would be a special event that would be held the following day. Basically, a lot of meetings, as well as paperwork. Now, I don't want to bore you with any of those details. But anyway, I needed to get some gas. And while I could go to the gas station that's closer to my house, I didn't think I was going to make it. So I just chose to fill up my car at the gas station that is just around the corner. Just as soon as I pull into the gas station, I begin to hear sudden yelling, as well as obscenities. Turning my attention behind me, there is a naked man running in all directions, and he's holding one of the largest knives I'd ever seen in my life before. I guess it would be more better to describe it as a machete of sorts. I freaked out, and then I went back into my car as the naked man ran over to me, and then jumped on top of my vehicle, showing his entire junk in front of my very own eyes. As if things couldn't get any worse. Similar to what happened to one of your subscribers in that recent Walmart Stories video you released, this man began to hit the hood of my vehicle with a machete, which would then cause dents and deep scratches to form. I know many of you are probably yelling at me from the other side of the screen and saying, Girl, why don't you just press on the gas and leave? Trust me, I look back on this and wonder the same exact thing, but I was just frozen with so much fear. Meanwhile, my brain was telling me to get the hell out of there, but my body was stuck. I know there's a word for this phenomena. Maybe one of you can leave it in the comments section. Anyway, while this seems to be going on for an eternity, more people start yelling at this crazed man to knock it off, as he then starts chasing after others. Police pulled up at the gas station, and what I witnessed next, I do also have to give a lessener discretion for. So, if you are squeamish to certain details, you might want to turn the audio down or skip this next section. Okay, you good now? Well, after giving the man commands that dropped a machete, he gets too close to one of the police officers. And, well, they shoot him dead. One of the bullets I recall being a headshot because his body would suddenly go limp and then he just fell like a log. I would be traumatized by seeing the bloody and gory sight, and even when a police officer came to check up on me and others, I couldn't stop shaking. I would seek therapy after this, and I did miss out on work, but after a while I would get better and move on with my life. Now whenever I tell people this story, I don't get so shaky or scared. It's more so, I look back on this and I think, Wow, I really saw someone get shot and killed, and I still believe to this day that if he went after the police officers, he most likely would have tried going after me and stabbing me as well. Oh, and by the way, the man with the machete from the news story that would be shown on the television was a homeless man that was on drugs, which would explain as to why he acted in such a violent fashion. I worked as a security guard at a bus depot in downtown Los Angeles from 1997 to 2001 in my employment of keeping a lookout for troublemakers, as well as long nights with dozens of cups of coffee. I had many encounters with lots of different people. Anyone that's in downtown LA in the evenings, well they know that you get quite the interesting crowd. 
Lots of times you'd get people who were partying at nearby bars. Then you'd have the homeless people who would be camping out. And then there were the crazy ones. While I had my fair share of having to deal with those drunks and those creeps, this one incident stands out to me the most. I recall it had been raining heavily and I was seeking cover underneath my little golf cart. I was also wrapped warmly and tightly in my heavy duty rain jacket and drinking some coffee I'd made in the office. There was a woman, about mid 40s, who just sat there all alone at one of the benches. She was presumably waiting for her bus to arrive, obviously underneath the cover of the roof above. I actually decided to drive on over to her and asked her if she needed anything because, you know, just trying to be a nice person. She asked me if I could get her a cup of coffee, as her bus wouldn't get there for about another 15 minutes. I, with a kind of smile, said, Yeah, absolutely. So I get on my radio to tell one of my co-workers if they could bring me a coffee to give to the lady. I accompanied her for about three minutes, until I'm told it was ready, and so I quickly head on over to grab it. The minute or so of me leaving would be the change of everything. As I turn the corner of one of the buildings, which then opens back into the bus depot, I happen to see the woman struggling to hold on to her purse. A hooded figure is trying to take it away from her. And the golf cart was too slow to get there in time, so I just booked it over there with a purpose on my own two legs. As the hooded figure lets go and then focuses his attention on me, at this moment, I thought to myself, Okay, he was trying to mug her, however he saw me, and so he's going to leave. Well, that wasn't what took place. The guy actually pulls out a switchblade, and then tells me he was going to slit my throat if I didn't leave. But no way was that happening. I called him out on his bluff, as I tell the lady to run. She does, but not before he gives her chase. Fight or flight then kicks in, and I chose to fight risking possible retaliation from this lunatic, but no way was I going to let him try and hurt this woman. I tackled the man down to the ground so hard, not only does the knife fall out of his grasp, but he hits and bumps his face right on the concrete floor. How we didn't bleed from that injury, I'm not too sure, but it could be because he put his arms up to soften a bit of the blow just in time. Anyway, I quickly grabbed the knife, and I told the guy to get lost because cops were already on the way. Now, obviously they weren't, as I hadn't gotten the chance to call them yet, but I was hoping that threat would get him to leave. Well, it ended up working. He just got up with his tail tucked in between his legs, so to speak, and then runs off. I went up to the lady right after that and asked if she was hurt, to which she says no, she was fine. She was just a bit frightened. She proceeds to thank me profusely and then calls me her hero, to which I told her I would do this for her and anyone to be honest. Her bus arrived two minutes later and she gave me an embrace before leaving and being on her way. I saw her three more times after that incident, but then she seemingly just disappeared. I did continue to work at that bus depot and luckily I never saw that jerk again. Who knows where that lady is today? By this point, she's got to be in her late 60s, maybe even early 70s, if my math and assumptions were off a bit, but I just hope she's okay and life has turned out well for her. She seemed like a really sweet lady, and I would hate to know if anyone has done anything bad to her. This took place in October 1997, when my mom was 16 years old. She ran away from her abusive home along with her friend Elisa. They hitchhiked from Massachusetts all the way to California. Obviously, this wasn't the brightest of plans though. But given my mom's tumultuous home life and past experiences, she didn't see how it could be much more dangerous than anything she'd already experienced. They had a pretty safe and uneventful trip across the country finding friends and many truck drivers and other travelers. It actually wasn't until they reached California when this encounter happens. So my mom and Lisa end up meeting these two guys who were super nice to them. They crashed at their place for a few days, partying, but nothing bad had come of it at this point. 
These guys tell the girls that they're going to take them to the Hollywood Hills, as well as Sunset Boulevard so they could see the sights. Not being from the area, my mom had no idea that these areas were more crime-ridden at the time, especially considering they were supposed to be sightseeing. My mom really wanted to see where all the movie stars lived. These guys take my mom and her friend to some little restaurant slash bar and then get them super drunk. It's also the first time my mother is introduced to and tries cocaine. After these underage girls are now completely high and drunk, they split off into pairs and my mom's friend disappears with one of these guys. My mom is now hanging out with just one of her new guy friends. He then suggests they stand on the sidewalk on Sunset Boulevard in the middle of the night, mind you, and if, when, a car pulls up, she should get in and direct the driver to drive across the street to this dark parking lot. It isn't really until the first and only car pulls up that she gets in and realizes that this guy is prostituting her out. Keep in mind these guys have been nothing but kind and respectful to my young mom and friend for the past few days. Also, and very sadly, this type of abuse is not a new concept for her either. She gets into this car and instead of pulling into the parking lot, he keeps on driving straight. My mom explains that he's gone the wrong way, so he starts now driving faster. My mom moves towards the door, but he locks it, hits her, and attempts to hold her down all at the same time. He tells her she isn't going anywhere. My mom knew in her head that she needed to get out of that car or she was going to be dead. So in one swift move, she unlocks the door, tucks and rolls out of the car. His car comes screeching to a halt now. She sees some bushes in front of a house, so she runs to hide behind them. He's turned around and he's looking for her, and he's still creeping along. His passenger side was now facing where she was hiding, and she was peeking through the bushes. That's where she saw he had a gun. As soon as his car crept by, she then ran to the backyard. It was all fenced in though, and there was no other way out so she had to go back the way she came from. By the time she crawled back into the bushes to see if he was still around, she saw his car had gone to the end of the road and turned back around. So he passes again and when she thought he was far enough away, she crawled out of the bushes to run, but then she sees his brake lights. Confident he's now seen her, she runs as fast as possible around a corner, but she could hear his car so she had to duck and hide behind the parked cars on the road. As soon as he passes again, she booked it across the street, which took her through the parking lot she was originally supposed to park in and back to her friend. The creep did circle back again, but by then she was with her friend and they were leaving the area. My mom and her friend had quickly ditched these two assholes and did find a safer place to stay in, but only a short time later did my mom call home and eventually made it home safely. It wasn't until a long time later that she saw on the news a story about women being murdered and even recognized the murderer. He was dubbed the Hillside Strangler, as the man who had picked her up that night was the same guy. A side note, my mom literally just dictated this story to me. I've heard it before, but not in so much detail. I told her about this subreddit and she said I should share her story. Now, not purposefully, but I googled an image of the hillside strangler and I showed my mom on my phone. Let's just say that she jumped so high, it actually really unnerved her recognizing him again. I feel bad about it. Edit. It was Kenneth Bianchi who drove the car this night. My mom said there was no questioning it was his distinguishing features and definitely his mustache. Edit number two. I've been reading these comments to my mother, retelling her story to me so I could accurately account for it has stirred some anxiety and feelings in her she didn't realize were there. So she just wants to say a genuine thank you for all the well wishes as well as the positive comments. I hope she finds comfort in them knowing that, although it was because of poor choices, hitchhiking and drinking with strangers. Her actions show how truly brave and strong she was, and is. Honestly, I'm so grateful for her. 
she is the most amazing woman I have ever known. Before I begin my story, I want to let you all know I was in my early 20s when this occurred. Now let me begin. I have a pretty creepy story I'd like to share here on the Creepy Fox. Even if it seems all is calm, you should never really be distracted. It's unfortunate it has to be that way, but you'll thank yourself in the end. This was roughly around 2005 or 2006, and I was just getting out of work. While on the way to pick up some Carl's Jr., I got a call from my mother. She asked me if I could stop by the grocery store to pick up a few items. Things like milk, bread, eggs, etc. I told her sure as I grabbed my order and started to make the 30 minute drive there. Halfway I realized there was a grocery store that had just opened not too far from where I currently was. I figured most grand openings have big deals so why not try it out? I did a U-turn at the street light I was waiting at and then I drove about 3 minutes into a shopping center with the store. It was huge and I was correct. They were having special deals. I didn't find this at Sprouts close to my house. So I grabbed the items my mom had requested, but then I sort of got carried away with the more groceries. Surely this basket was starting to get kind of heavy, so I leave my things with one of the friendly cashiers as I go outside to grab a shopping cart. The carts were at the side of the building where there was only one light source, which came from above the building. I guess I should have mentioned that this was around 7.45pm when it was dark. When I grabbed my cart, a man approached me and tried to initiate a conversation. He was average height and built. He was wearing a large Dodgers baseball t-shirt with some baggy jeans. He had a Dodgers hat to match his shirt and he was I'd say in his early 40s. I don't remember the exact things he said but he did compliment my hair and said I was very beautiful. I thanked him as I start to walk away, but he stops me and asks if I could give him my phone number. I didn't say anything, however. I just showed him my hand and pointed to the engagement ring I was wearing. He let out an, oh, I see, before he just walked away. Fast forward roughly 15 minutes later. I've already paid and I'm starting to head back to my car which was a bit of a ways at the back end of the parking lot. Once done placing everything in the back seat, I went to put the shopping cart back where I had originally gotten it from. I used to work at a Ralph's grocery store a year prior to this incident. And trust me, I know how annoying it is to deal with the customers who just leave their carts scattered across the parking lot. That's why I wanted to do this Sprouts a favor. But here's when things started to get pretty creepy. I placed my shopping cart in the little waiting area and then I began heading back to my vehicle again. Out of nowhere, an unmarked van with its windows tinted is stopped in front of me near my vehicle. Quite annoying, but it would be the least of my concerns. Suddenly the window is rolled down and I see the man who had the Dodgers hat behind the wheel. The back door suddenly opens and a man who looked to be sporting some sort of blade told me to get in but that wasn't going to happen. I tell them no and then make a run for it back to the grocery store. Thank goodness there is a security guard nearby. I was able to wave him down and by the time I looked back to the parking area, I could see the unmarked van beginning to exit the parking. The security guard was pretty confused as I began relaying what I had just gone through. He got the manager and then I stayed with him until the police arrived. I gave them all the possible details I could remember, as well as some other customers who did the same thing. The officers escorted me back to my house, and let's just say I had trouble sleeping that night. As for the man in the Dodgers t-shirt, as well as that van, I can't really say for sure I know their location today, but here's hoping they have since changed their ways. Edit. I forgot to mention, but this took place in the downtown LA area. Anyone else out there look forward to when you would show up to school and your teacher would tell the classroom, hey, we're going on a field trip next week? Well, naturally, you jump for joy and excitement, 
Finally, an adventure that isn't just you and your friends listening to hours and hours of your teacher talking. Well, that's where I found myself in the 8th grade back in the early 2000s. We would be going to a natural history museum in Los Angeles. It featured awesome fossils of dinosaurs, as well as many other creatures. See, this was a field trip as part of my science class. Of course, we were required to write a paper on the adventure, because we can't just go on a field trip and have fun without being productive, right? I digress. We make the two-hour drive from our school one early Friday morning, and we arrive to our destination at around 9am. This was going to be a whole day thing, and it was split up into different parts. For the first three or so hours, we would take a guided tour, pretty much the entire history lesson. Then for an hour, we would have our lunch. Then it was another few hours of learning, Then the last hour was for us. Of course, we were told how far we could go, and we made sure to stick close to the teacher's supervision. However, being the adventurous 8th grader I was, my friends and I decided to break this one rule. A rule, mind you, that we would soon regret. Anyway, in this story, we will call my other friends, Evelyn and Lauren. So, once it was 4pm, our last hour break had arrived. Most students took the opportunity to go into the gift shops and take pictures with their friends. As for my small group, we decided to go on our little adventure that I mentioned. Why not check out the nearby city and see what sorts of neat things that we could do? There weren't many shops, but we thought it would be nice to be away from the teachers. So we cross the street from the museum and head down a few blocks until we do see some stores. It's here we spent the next half hour shopping for some little souvenirs and whatever else we could fit into our backpacks. After all, we didn't want the teachers noticing if we bought any clothing that wasn't from the museum. Speaking of noticing, we began to notice this homeless man who was keeping up pace. At first we thought maybe he was just walking in our general direction, but after he followed us into a couple of shops and then would look the other way if we looked into his eyes, we began to grow quite concerned. So concerned, in fact, that we actually decided to cut the small adventure short and return back to the museum where the rest of our class is. Fast forward another five minutes later, and we are waiting at a stoplight awaiting to cross. Behind us is an alleyway from what I remember, I assumed led you further into the city, but it wasn't much of importance to us, at least not in that moment. As we stood there talking and thinking how we were making a big deal, one of my friends suddenly has this look of fear across her face. I asked her what was wrong, and she tells us to turn around. There are two men just a few mere feet away from us. One of them was the homeless looking guy from minutes ago, and another one was brand new. But what made the sight of these two even creepier was the fact that both appear to be holding on to pocket knives. Yeah, no kidding. Here in the middle of the sidewalk on this cold November dark afternoon, this field trip just went from fun to scary in an instant. By the way, I can recall there was barely any foot traffic in where we stood, thus I think that's why these two decided to try their luck. Needless to say, we booked it across the small intersection. Thank God no cars were in the way since the Walkman sign still hadn't come on. And once on the museum property, we managed to wave down a few students from our classroom. We told them about the men who had been chasing us, but as expected we turned back only to see the men were now long gone. Well, we could see them, it's just that they were beginning to walk back from the way they came from, as if nothing had actually happened. It turns out the teachers had already contacted the police though, as they thought we had gone missing, or even worse. Gotta love our overprotective teachers, but it's better than having ones who don't care. Now let's just say we got a good talking to from police officers, as well as the teachers about how we shouldn't wander off unattended, we did have to write an entire paper on why we should never split up from the classroom. Also, I was grounded for a month. So, lesson learned, I guess. Always stick with your teachers and classmates whenever you are on a field trip. Edit. I don't know whatever happened with those two homeless guys, but being chased in LA 
isn't exactly a good thing. Back in the late 1990s, I used to be a security guard at this now non-existent dance club in Los Angeles. Considering we were located near the downtown area, you can imagine how busy the weekends got. On top of that, this was during a time when there was a lot of crime in the city. Anyone living in LA during that time period, well most likely you remember all the events that took place. Anyway, back to my job as a security guard. Now, apart from the occasional arguments and me having to kick people out, nothing would prepare me for this one night. So this evening, it had been especially busy, and I was called on my day off to come help out. I honestly didn't mind since I needed the money anyway, so I showed up to work an hour later. That night, I was in charge of checking people in by looking over their IDs. I'll tell you this night there were easily over 200 people waiting to get inside. After an hour or so, we managed to get everyone in and I'm finally catching a break. At around 11pm, the party inside was getting really rowdy and I had to kick out this man who had been picking fights with some of the fellow dancers. Now I myself am a fairly large build, 6 foot 3, 280 pounds, not much could really intimidate me. This guy, however, had this look on his face of being a troublemaker. Something about him just spelled all suspicious. He was wearing a long white t-shirt, oversized pants that were really baggy and had tattoos all over his arms and neck. I put him at about 6 foot, maybe 240 to 250 pounds. Anyway, the guy clearly had one too many drinks as he had been in a shouting match with another guest. As I go to escort him out of the building, the guy grabs a glass bottle and hits my arm. Great, there was now glass all over the ground. I was livid. I immediately get the guy down and was finally able to get him out of the building. Go home pal, you've clearly been drinking too much. Wait until I bring my friends. Be careful with who you're messing with. Whatever. I ignored him and went into the back room to put some bandages on my arm. Fast forward an hour or so later, and my security guard buddy Andrew had arrived to join me for the evening. As people were leaving the club, we started a conversation with this young couple who were telling us about this being their first time here. They were really nice, and we must have been talking to them for about 20 minutes. Out of nowhere, I hear some people speaking Spanish behind me. I didn't recognize two of the voices, but the third one sounded quite familiar. I turn around and it's the same man from an hour ago who I kicked out. He was now joined by two similar looking men who had these looks of pure malice. Without saying anything else, one of them comes up to me and then shoves me. I of course was trying to keep my composure so I ignore it. He pushes me again and begins telling me all these crazy things. At this point, Andrew had stopped talking with the couple and had now joined me. At that very moment, Andrew reacts to something that saved all of our lives. He sees as one of the men reaches into their pocket and he's about to take something out. Without thinking twice, Andrew jumps at him and then tackles him to the floor. This causes a handgun to fall out of his pocket, which I now kick out of the way. Of course, we had no idea of knowing if these other guys might have had something on them. Well, I spring into action and I'm helping Andrew out, but we're still two versus three. Luckily, some other people see the scuffle and they join to help us. While this is happening, the young couple had been calling police explaining what was going on. Needless to say, we took care of those guys and they were taken away about 15 minutes later. This happened to me in West Hollywood, Los Angeles in 2015. I just left a Halloween party and I was dressed as Beetlejuice. An Uber dropped me off at my house, Curzon and Melrose, for anyone familiar with the area, and I started to wander around looking for a food truck. I'd seen them around before and didn't really feel nervous walking around as a woman at night by myself. That's because it's not exactly an abandoned area and it's not exactly known for its crime. 
I figured I'd find something within a few minutes and then I'd be on my way home. Plus, I'd only had one or two drinks at this point, nothing to really take my level of alertness down. The problem occurred when I decided to walk between avenues. I wasn't having any luck on Melrose, so I decided to walk north down a residential block. That way I could get to another avenue where I'd have more luck. I remember I really wanted to listen to music. So, first mistake. I was looking down at my phone, queuing up a song to play aloud without headphones while I walked. I didn't realize a man was running at me from behind. This was at full speed by the way. That was until he was almost on top of me. Two things happened at once. I realized there was a person literally sprinting at me, and right as I stepped out of the way, he tripped over some fallen palm leaves that weren't visible in the darkness. He stumbled, but didn't fall, and I said something like, Are you okay? But he didn't reply. He just kept running at full speed until he reached the corner and turned left out of my sight. I immediately felt that what had happened was very, very sinister. Looking around, there was no one behind him or in front of him, no friends or someone who dared him to pull some sort of prank, and I got enough of a look at his clothing that he wasn't in running gear at all. Now, even if he had been, why would he be out at 1am, alone, and running at full speed? He legitimately would have slammed into me if I hadn't stepped out of the way at the last second. I can't help but think that something terrible would have happened if I hadn't hurt his feet, or he wouldn't have tripped. What do you guys think? Hey creepy fox, I'm a long time listener here. Though this incident was about 30 years ago, I still remember it because that was the year I met my girlfriend, now wife, Megan. It was Christmas Eve. I was young, 22 years old, and it was 1987. I was working at a drive-up convenience store in the downtown LA area. For those of you in Southern California who have been around for that long, you might remember that year we got a record amount of rain we hadn't seen in almost a decade even though most of the streets were getting flooded. Anyway, there I was sitting on my chair, enjoying a warm cup of coffee with a bagel, when out of nowhere a man walked up wearing a black poncho. I gave him a warm welcome and told him that if he needed anything, I was here to help him. I then returned to my delicious snack. The man never did say anything to me. He kind of just walked around and then disappeared behind the building 30 seconds later. Bear in mind, I wasn't able to see his face due to the poncho's hoodie covering his identity. That and also the lights at our drive-up convenience store being pretty dull. It actually wasn't until two weeks after this incident the boss finally decided to upgrade to brighter illumination. Anyway, a strange sight, but I quickly wrote him off as some complete random stranger. I was actually more focused on getting home, so that way I could take a nice hot long shower, and I could also eat some of the cooking my mom had prepared me. About two minutes later, the rain was beginning to fall even heavier, and thunder was clapping in the sky above. Suddenly, a black SUV tries to pull up into the drive through I placed my cup of coffee on the counter table, then walked over to the vehicle to help out this customer. But what happens next was one of the most frightening experiences of my life. Every single door, minus the drivers, opens, and men in ski masks jump out armed with guns. They start telling me to put all the money that's in the cash register into a bag. Meanwhile, I'm standing there, completely frozen with fear. And the men repeated their aggressive commands, as finally I turn around and head toward the cash register. There waiting for me was the first man I'd seen a couple of minutes earlier, the one that had the poncho on, who I later determined was the lookout. He too revealed he was packing heat as he takes out a gun. All of this seemed to go on in slow motion, but it was honestly only about 30 seconds in total. 30 seconds of complete nightmare fuel. We only had about $500 of cash in the register, but to them they didn't care. They took the money 
and even some packs of beer from the refrigerator, as well as the stacks of scratcher tickets. Once the men hopped back into their car, the driver looked at me and said something along the lines of, If you ever tell anyone what happened here, or we find out you called the cops, you're going to be killed. They stormed off, and I just sat there for the next five minutes at a loss of words having a panic attack. I was so scared. It wasn't until a customer had arrived and looked at me that I was able to snap out of it. Although in the moments that customer arrived, I thought it was the robbers coming back to finish the job, but it wasn't. I ended up explaining to the gentleman about my ordeal, and it turned out he was a security guard just clocking off his shift, and he wanted to come and pick up a Pepsi and some chips. I begged him to stay there and keep me company, and bless his heart, he did until the police got there. I would file a police report, and an investigation was launched by the Los Angeles Police Department, but I still to this day am unsure of those men's whereabouts. I ended up quitting a few days later, and I had a falling out with the manager and my co-workers. Fast forward all these years later, I live in Salt Lake City, and I'm married to my wife Megan. We have three kids around your age, with the youngest one being a huge fan of yours. Anyway, we want to wish you and your family all the best, Creepy Fox. Here's to things getting better. Hey, thanks for watching today's episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories Podcast. If you did enjoy, then make sure to leave a like rating and leave a comment down below letting me know what you all thought. Also, if you are a first-time listener joining us for the first time and you did enjoy, then consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell beside it. As I mentioned in the intro, we do upload some of the best true crime and scary stories content that you'll hear on YouTube, so subscribe and look forward to more content. Speaking of stories, if you yourself do have a story that you'd like to submit, then do send it in with the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you and a shout out to all my channel members. Thank you to Spunky the Nutcase, Bo, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Robbie, and Susie. Thank you so much. Your support means the world and it helps me with continuation of releasing brand new Scary Stories content and focusing more on the channel. Also, of course, thank you to the regular viewers who watch the videos, leave likes, comments, and share the videos with family and friends. Anyway, that is going to go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you all on the next episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. Take care, and have yourself an amazing day.